the main thing for us is just the amount of times that we follow up leads and then you know harness and harvest them to the point that they become clients. This is the business of architecture. Hello, Architect Nation, and welcome back to today's episode. This is Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for structuring your architectural practice so you can do your best work more often. Today, I'm excited to have British architect Joseph Aga on the show. He's the owner of AGA Associates. The firm is based in the Great Britain, and the firm has been able to land impressive commissions thanks to Aga's innovative kingmaker strategy. And I thought this was very interesting is why I wanted to have him here on the on the podcast is really thinking strategically about your business development because it's one thing to stay within the realm and the, the, the ocean of clients that you've had in the past, but it's an entirely another thing. What if the products that you're currently getting maybe aren't living up to your expectations or perhaps you've been doing them for so long it sort of seems like more of the same and you'd like to up-level to the next level? Well, this is where I think you'll find this episode to be very intriguing. In addition, you'll also discover how Joseph Aga is innovating in the delivery of the firm's architectural services. He's up to some very interesting things. And uh, so with that, let's jump into this episode. Uh, just one more thing, though. If you haven't already headed over to Smart Practice method.com to get access to and watch our 60 minute free firm owner masterclass. What are you waiting for? Head over there now, discover we've dis distilled over a decade plus of research in our work helping small architectural practices be able to structure their practice so they can do the work they love. Less admin, less administration, less being a slave to the wheel, and more actually being an architect. Head over to smartpracticemethod.com. And with that, here is today's episode and my conversation with Joseph Aga. Hello, Joseph, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Hello, Enoch. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Joseph, I'm really curious. Your background, you were working for Gensler in London. You have a strong technical background, also a strong design background. And you were showing me the way that you've set up your sheets on our pre-call that we had a few weeks ago. You were showing me how you include all the information for a project and for a particular room on one sheet, which is quite different from uh, other drawing sets that I've seen in the past. Could you tell me how this came about? How did you decide to change up the way that drawings are typically organized in an architectural project? Uh, I, I had a lot of experience working on site, you know, almost as a site architect. And during that time, I was always trying to explain, you know, um, the setup of sheets to uh, the various contractors. And I was always trying to imagine what they would see, how they would distribute that information to the various subcontractors and how we could package that information. Okay, so from there, it started getting me to think, I started to look at the old way, how they used to put various sheets in series, as they would call in the UK, and then looking at how, how would you want to receive it if you're a contractor and if you were delegating the various information to subcontractors, you know, and how would that limit the amount of RFIs, what we call requests for information. And all of a sudden I realized that once we started putting our schedules in there, we say internal base studies with the various elevations and the various uh, schedules that linked to these various elevation, all of a sudden it, it reduces the amount of RFIs. And all of a sudden that meant the coordination of the project became a lot better and a lot more seamless. So. For me, it just made logical sense in order to progress in that manner. You know, it's it's not the first time that, that I've heard that, especially in my own architectural career and other firms that we've worked with. Oftentimes, contractors, when they get the drawing set, they'll partition out, they'll send the plumbing drawings off to the plumbing contractors, they'll send the mechanical off to mechanical, and yet there might be information that's picked up on the architectural sheets that aren't necessarily in those sheets. Or, as you mentioned, they'll go to the job site and you'll see a crumpled up piece of paper kind of sitting there on the on the job site table, you know, with a bunch of smudges on it, and it looks quite dirty, and it's been, it's it's seen its it's seen its use, so to speak, um, but they're missing other sheets. And you kind of ask them, well, what, what are the other sheets? They're like, oh, this is the only sheet I have. And so it's not uncommon to find that contractors are missing all the information because if you need a whole entire set of drawings to get the complete picture for your scope of work, first of all, it's sort of a bit of a friction point. 
So the contractors, oftentimes it can cost several hundred dollars, if not thousand, to print out a set of drawings, and they're not going to want to print out a set for every single contractor. Thus, we get the separation of pages, information starts to get lost, and like you said, ultimately that impacts the work because then they don't have the right information, they miss things, and they're installing the work incorrectly or they're missing critical specifications or details that would help the, the work happen. So you have a different approach, and just describe to us, you kind of hinted to it, alluded to it just previously, you put the elevations, the schedules, you combine all the information that the contractor would need for one particular area. Is it per room, and you put that on one sheet? Can you describe that? How does that, how does that work? So say, for example, you'd have a plan, and maybe inside a plan, you're looking at a hotel suite, and inside that hotel suite, you're looking at the lounge, the lounge might have four faces. All of a sudden, you want to understand where the door is, the light switches, the heights of them. You want to see what the pendants are. You want to see all the four faces. And then you also want to see the measurements from floor to ceiling. You know, and you understand where the service zone is, for the mechanicals, where the limitations are. And it just makes it a lot easier. And then all of a sudden, say, for example, if you're doing like a floor plan, for example, and you're looking at underfloor heating, you're going to have like the underfloor heating, you're going to have your hot and your cold, you're going to have your foul water in there. And at the same time, if you've got grey water that you're mixing in as well, it's good to show the service route all in one drawing. And on top of that, you can also see the various plumbing uh, schedule and the specifications that come with that. So ideally when, say, for example, the plumber or the mechanical engineer is looking at it, you can see where his aspect, aspects would fit onto your architectural aspects that will finish maybe at the finish level. But the first fix, they get a good understanding of where it needs to be and how much space they need to allow for within our stud walls or things like that. So it just makes it a lot easier. And, and how long have you been using this, this new way of organizing your drawings? Oh, oh it's, it's, uh, it's been a work in progress and it's tiny little iterations that get better and better and better for each project. And then also when, when I'm working with the team, I'm also looking to see how fast they progress from one stage to the other. So I will look at a package and I might look at maybe a stage three package and look at it and it might take eight weeks to do. And then all of a sudden, if they present it in a very particular way, it might take them six weeks to do and they manage to put all the relevant information all on the right sheets. And at the same time, it, the reason why they get faster and faster is because they're seeing everything and all on one sheet that they need to resolve rather than dipping into various different wall types, floor types, ceiling types, ele electrical types. It's it, 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 For me, it kind of feels as if that's a bit of a redund redundant way of doing something. And when you're on site, you know, when it gets to the nitty gritty things, the the contractor is going to be taking sending it to the various subcontractors, and then they're going to have some of them. They won't always look in isolation, but they'll be looking at their potential aspect. And at times, you might have scenarios where certain room or areas are in abeyance, and they can't crack on with certain spaces. So all of a sudden, the, the beauty about that strategy is we can just typically say to them, look, that area is in abeyance, crack on with these other areas that are not in abeyance that you've got the full package for. And they go, okay, I can run with it. You know, so it, 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 it just works as a, it's, it's breaking them into little small bite-sized pieces in order to be done more efficiently. You know, so that's a strategy. And what feedback have contractors given you on this type of setting up your drawings the way you've done it? Um, what's really interesting is some contractors, say for example, like to remove their existing architects and bring us on board just because of the pure simplicity and the fact that we provide the schedules that work with parameters as things change, everything changed in good time. So all of a sudden when they're receiving these packages and they want to make something like, I don't know, like a contractor design portion, all they would need to do is change that product within the schedule. And then that would change because everything else if that we put in the drawing is all indicative anyway. Does that make sense? So in a way, you, you get to maintain the performance criteria, the specification, without compromising too much on the design intent. So yeah. this is why we, we, we find it very important to give 
developers, not developers, give contractors this level of uh, flexibility because half the time from our experience, lots of them have got a lot of experience. They've been in the building realm for such a long time and there's various ways of skinning a cat. So they might have a look at something and say, hey, I know that you've got this type of stud work, all of it, this, this type, and it might be, I don't know, like British gypsum, but there's this other type of stud work, which is, you know, 35% cheaper than that one. So there's gonna be value engineering that occurs if we get to swap it out. Are you able to do it? And we just press one click of a button, the parameters change, and then it puts in their, um, their request within our schedule. So you haven't had any contractors be confused, have you, by the layout because they're so used to the way that other firms lay out their drawings? Yeah, because typically what was happening before, I'll give you an example, like you'd have loads of strip sections showing the elevations. But then in my eyes, when you're looking at a strip section for the elevation, what would you rather see? Would you rather just see four strip sections showing detail or would you have one sheet with one flat elevation? one plan in relation to that, a little section with a one to five details, all in relation and associated to that one aspect of that cladding detail. And what we often find is when we're on site and we're having a discussion or we're having a site meeting, we can pull up one sheet and resolve all issues by just looking into one sheet that everybody can see all the wider scenarios that affect it, not just the one section. Because typically if they had a um, a string of sections, four of them on a sheet, and then they have to look on another set of elevations. Then they have to look at another one to find that those are three sheets all of a sudden, you know, yeah. that they're looking at just to decide on one particular scenario, you know. So I fundamentally just thought this sounds a little bit abortive and I, everything that we do, we want to do it in the BIM way, the built information modeling way, where everything's kind of streamlined. There's at least minimum three steps. And if we keep on progressing like that, it just uh, becomes a little bit easier to understand as well. How do you avoid team members putting line work on top of BIM? I know that sometimes team members, they won't be able to do something in BIM, and so they'll put some line work on top of it or something, and then that doesn't get updated with the parameters. Do you have any sort of rules or processes in the practice to keep team members from actually drawing on there so that the, the BIM model stays true? So what we do, do that? you know, we, we utilize what we call detailed items and inside the detailed items, we put them inside groups and inside those groups, when we change it, that one group, it changes everywhere because it's, it's, it's almost like a component. So it changes. So as soon as they update that detailed item group, no matter where that is in a project, it will all change simultaneously at the same time, which is quite nice. So it saves you so much work and Say, for example, if you've done, I don't know, like a thousand projects and you're looking through various details, you can start touching on projects that you've done that detail to. You can grab that whole group or that detail item, apply it to the next project. And all of a sudden you save so much time or you're kind of resolving is the junction details and the amount of speed because you've already got the big critical moves for previous projects and yes you're checking things like u values for the thermal you know comforts and the size of the the insulation and these aspects and understanding where the damp proof membrane is and also the water vapor barrier but once you get around that the details the detail you know it becomes if you just follow the fundamental rules of where they need to sit in application to the structures and the mep then it it just becomes it's like Lego blocks. You just know where yeah. to place so it. So are you saying that you, 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 your team models everything, even down to the detail components, that everything's modeled in 3D using BIM? No, so they use the saying? they use the detailed items, which is actually 2D, you know, because okay. it, because we I had a scenario whereby we were having a look at 3D items, but it was so cumbersome and the the original 3D wall, say for example in BIM, it, it the format that it would be in wouldn't react accurately to the one to fives, and plus one of the things that we realised is the detailed items work really well with the specifications in order to get them to understand the format of each other, whereby a, a huge stack wall, for example in BIM, that will only will only understand layers like say the brick layer, 
you know, the cavity layer, the insulation layer, you know, the SFS system behind it or the masonry behind it, and then the plasterboards. And it would do it in these layers where actually the one to five is a lot more detailed. You've got very intricate components, especially ones that you're mixing in with say structural engineers, information that you need to make sure is right, that sits in the right location. And these are very intricate details that profiles will have to be made in accordance to the manufacturer detail, you know, but mm -hmm. the beauty about it, yeah. once you've done it once, it's almost, you've already created an archive. You created a library of details, you know, so you're not really reworking the wheels. There's various parameters that you need to check in regards to the installation and where the location of damp proof course is and the water vapor barrier. But apart from that, a brick doesn't change its dimensions. A block work doesn't change its dimensions. You know, the concrete in situ is typically the same, you know, depending if you're going for a concrete frame or a steel frame structure. So there's a lot of things <clears throat> that don't move. You know, maybe if you've got an intricate rain screen or something, that's different, but that's going to be a special in regards to it's going to be a bespoke item that needs more technical work, if that makes sense. Mm. Let's switch directions here. And I'm curious, what do you feel is the AGA associate secret? What's the secret sauce? To getting work why do you win the products that you win is it your natural charm is your ability to, to pitch is it your your network is it all your social media postings that you do is it the fact that you're just famous and people flock to you just because they want to work with you no it's, it's actually, your secret sauce to acquiring work it's um desperation it's perpetual fear <laughs> no i'm joking um the main thing is for me one of the things i looked at was I looked at how some of my mentors were uh, bringing in work and I looked at how some of these other contemporary businesses, not exactly architecture practices, of how they were creating marketing tools and how they were harnessing them. And I'm a huge believer that in order to be ahead of the curve, we have to embrace the curve. So um, one of the things that we started to do was to look at, say, how we can start making the website completely um, SEO um, optimized and making sure, making sure that, say, for example, the content that we're producing is consistent and also making sure that we are reaching out to um, particular individuals in the industry, you know, that, um, well, <clears throat> there was... And also, they what we another thing that we started to do. We came up with a term called king and queen makers, right? Whereby all of a sudden, instead of waiting for clients to come to us, we started to make our own clients. You know, so we'd be discussing with an investor. We find ways in order to create them with funding options. You know, with other financial associates. And then all of a sudden, these individuals, they may come to us and they say, we got like 500,000, right? But then with the fi financial options that are put forward, they could start putting in project for maybe, you know, 8 million. And if they've got 3 million with the financial option, they can start going in for 20 million. So all of a sudden we started making our own clients, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't meet many of them. It was just the ones that, you know, were energetic, had the, that had this goal of developing as many developments as possible, residential, mainly res residential and uh, mixed use schemes. And then from there, you know, creating a, excuse me, creating some sort of syndicate whereby we offer our services to the syndicate and we help source properties and land in order to highlight the potential areas of growth and then uh, move forward accordingly. So it sounds like you're saying your secret sauce is that you actually bring in the funding. You help your clients get access to the funding and because you're the ones that control the purse strings, that gives you a lot of flexibility with the kind of products you work on and really, let's say, increases the client's desire to work with you. Would that be a false statement? Yes, I think, I think so. I think we encourage, we encourage investors and developers. So we, we encourage them to think bigger 
We always encourage them to think bigger. We'll do a feasibility and a viability study in order to show what bigger would look like to them. And we would highlight, say, for example, we have various investors that will be requesting us to source or, you know, investigate uh, various sites. And maybe it might be three of them. And out of the three, they'll only pick one of them. And then when you've got a syndicate of maybe, I don't know, like 300 individuals in it, the, the individual that picked one out of three, that sort of still means there's two useful sites and somebody else would find them useful to develop as well. You know, so what's good for one person isn't great for another, but vice versa. And then once we realized that, we it kind of had a, a bit of a eureka moment. I was like, wait, wait, I know uh, client A purchased that site, but we've got two more sites and there's like 299 other individuals that are looking for sites. They'll, they'll literally snap your fingers off for them, depending if it's right for them. And depending on what they're trying to do and their budget and their time constraints as well you know so that was definitely something that i i that was kind of found by accident it was it kind of fell into that oh. you know what are the what are the best areas to find or what have been your best strategies for finding investors finding money so you can start to be the king maker and queen maker as you put it um harvesting the right type of investors and just being patient in a sense whereby you could have conversations that might have take three years in the making you know and not pressing but making sure that you have tags on leads and you're chasing them up every once in a while just to touch base with them but trying to touch base with them but not trying to touch base with them from a selling point of view it's more like touch your base with them like hello how are you how are you getting on how's the family you know um how's the business going where's your, where's your head at at the moment there's an opportunity that came up you know you don't need to go for this one but there'll be another one and i'm sure if you're interested i can drop you you know an email in good time and talk a little bit more about that let me know if you're ready this is the timeline you know get, get in touch and then you know Follow it up, you know, just follow it up. But the, the main thing for us is just the amount of times that we follow up leads um, and then um, harness them, you know, harness and harvest them to the point that they become clients, you know, at a later mm -hmm. date, you know. So this is really fundamental. Yeah, absolutely. Joseph, in, in the United States, we have something called an accredited, accredited investor. So to be able to invest in a project like that or to put together a syndication, um, there are certain legal requirements that need to happen. For instance, investors need to have earned in the United States, I think it's $250,000 per year for the past, I don't know how many years, maybe two or three years, right? So if they're an accredited investor, then they're eligible to be able to invest in syndicates and fund event and investment deals and things like that. Do you have something similar in the UK? And if so, are you the one that arranges all the paperwork to set up the syndicates or do you have a legal partner that, that, that does that work? We, that we, part of the we have, we have, a, we have a legal partners. We work very closely with lenders, you know, so um, they will sort out that aspect, but what we will do, we will introduce, the various investors to the lenders and then we'll have a caveat in there that basically says that if you are to receive this type of funding that AJ Associates will act as lead consultants on this project because there you go of course yeah, so we will, it would, we will it would yeah, it'd be very painful to have someone else get the project after no, you do all that hard work we, so, <laughs> I, so we will so we will sign various type of agreements with the lender to make sure that that's caveated and make sure there's a make sure there's a mandate in there and we'll basically say look we're happy to bring more investors in however the rule is you can't go forward with them unless we are lead consultants and you know if you introduce various investors to these type of lenders, they're not going to really question anything else. They're going to go, you know, thank you very much. And you're telling me that you have the lead consultancy team that will coordinate this whole project from inception to completion. That's a win-win for them because all, all of a sudden you're creating a package for them and it helps them to relax. And you, you treat the whole process almost like a journey and it becomes like a very immersive experience, you know. So instead of them having to go off and see architects, 
structural engineers, civils, MEP, um, building surveyors, party wall surveyors. All of a sudden, we will coordinate all of that on their behalf because we have a framework of various consultants that we work with. And we have a framework of builders and contractors that we work with as well. So it makes it easier in order to coordinate the thing, the whole um, process. That's wonderful. Well, Joseph, thanks for joining us today. Those You've shared two very important and valuable tips with us. One, for how you set up your drawings, and secondly, how you have created a bit of a development or financing arm. And you also mentioned that you were inspired by Joe Cohen's model. Oh, yes. Uh, you heard about that here on the podcast. I was, and that I was listening one that day. As well. Yeah, definitely. I was listening one day, and I had it on in the, in the background, as you do, because I almost feel like as a director, you... You only have limited people that will really understand, you know, um, the, the I'd say the struggle and the various constraints that you'd have in regards to running a practice. And when I heard Joe Cohen, I was thinking, to myself, you know what? There's a lot of comments, positive comments that she made there that we can definitely relate to. And I didn't know anyone else did it like that, you know. You know, but it's very interesting when you hear what the wider, um, you know, establishment, you know, how they work and how they operate. And then you start to um, pull upon similar similarities, which are quite nice. So it, it, was, it was a positive moment and a, a very big eye opener. So that was quite nice. Well, Joseph, thank you for joining us on the show today. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And, um, you know, I absolutely respect and love what you guys do. And it's a huge insight to a lot of companies out there that uh, run architectural practices, you know, and uh, thank you for creating a platform for it. It's an absolute honor to be here. Thank you. And that's a wrap. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.